All right, I'll be the last speaker today. My name is Mark Weir Suzuki. I'm the Chief Materials Engineer at the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. Um, just to give you uh, a little background about the Port Authority, um, we maintain and operate five airports, uh, two in New Jersey, Newark and Teterboro, and three in New York, JFK, LaGuardia, and Stewart Airport, which is in upstate New York. Um, we also maintain and operate four bridges, the most notable, the George Washington Bridge. All our bridges and tunnels uh, connect New Jersey to New York. Uh, so if you're in thinking of a bridge or a tunnel that connects New York to New York, it's not us. Uh, <laughs> but uh, two tunnels, Holland Lincoln Tunnel, uh, across the uh, Hudson River between New Jersey and New York. Two bus terminals, uh, the one main one in Midtown, and there's also a bus terminal at the George Washington Bridge. Five marine terminals, uh, three on the New York side, two on the Jersey side. Uh, the World Trade Center as well, and we have a path commuter uh, uh, passenger rail system. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about uh, specification performance requirements that are needed to increase the potential for a successful project. Doesn't guarantee anything, nothing's guaranteed, um, but I'm gonna talk about some things that you could specify that will greatly increase the potential for success. Uh, Non-prescriptive requirements for a concrete pavement mix design. Uh, I'm gonna talk about blending aggregates. Um, it's been alluded to in, in previous uh, presentations. Um, and the importance of performing a test section, okay, prior to commencing production. It's nothing worse you, than to start production on a, a brand new runway and you're working out the kinks of having your problems with the contract. You get that stuff all out of the way with a test section. Uh, and some key items to monitor during construction. Okay. So a little overview of the project. Okay, the runway is this one right up here, 13 left, 31 right. It's about 9,000 feet long. Okay, this is the runway that we're talking about today. Okay, um, this goes into a lot of detail about scope, but um, some of the main points, we're widening this runway from 150 feet to 200 feet to accommodate uh, the new larger aircraft, in particular, uh, the A380 model. Um, so I'm not going to get into any of this other stuff. You got the slides, you can read them whenever you want. Timeline. Okay, so FAA gives us eight months from the time of award to the time of opening this runway. Um, we're talking over 100,000 cubic yards of concrete with an 18 inch thick pavement. Um, and pretty much our pavement schedule was really six months. We started um, the second week of May, I believe, of 2019. And we finished at the end of October. Uh, so a tight schedule. So here's a little summary, uh, 229 day closure. Uh, over 2,800 slabs, over 110,000 cubic yards of pavement. Um, a lot of work to do in a short amount of time. So here we go. Now, if anyone's familiar with JFK Airport, if you've ever traveled there or flew out of uh, JFK, you will know that the last two miles of getting, getting to the airport, it could take you an hour to get there. So with the volume of concrete that we're talking about, we had two on-site batch plants uh, built. Uh, we could not afford delays in, in, in material delivery. Uh, so we, part of the project cost was to build these two on-site batch plants that were uh, certified by the New York State DOT. 
So each day, these are the batch, batch plants, two of them I mentioned. We have our stockpiles for our aggregates. We're gonna get into those. We had uh, three different types of uh, coarse aggregate plus our sand. So four stockpiles. Uh, you're gonna see four bin feeders in a moment for uh, the aggregates. Each day of production, we, we probably ran around 2,000 cubic yards each day, went as high as 3,700 yards in a given day. Uh, that's 180 trucks in a, on a most productive day, over 300. 65 poor days, uh, we needed to complete the entire 9,000 feet of runway. So here's a look at one of the batch plants in the four bins, the aggregate feeders. Um, <coughs> specification requirements and mixed design. Okay, so here's the pavement. It's 18 inches thick. Uh, inch, I mean, 1.5% slope from, from crown to edge line. Um, the One second. Here's our slab layout, um, 25 by 25 uh, slab panels. Now, I know the FAA, I think, believe currently specifies a maximum of 20 feet between joints. Um, somehow, my predecessor convinced the FAA that we could do 25 foot joints, which, you know, eliminates a lot of problems. The more joints you have, the more potential problems you have. Uh, and longevity issues. Um, we, we have proven that we could do 25 foot joints um, and not have uh, cracking issues. Uh, so that's what we do. And so with the max that FAA allows 20 foot joint spacing, we save 20% of cutting of joints. Uh, saves on labor um, and we get you know, less potential issues with, with uh, joints. So for our specs, pavements greater than 10 inches in thickness, I, well, obviously you got your standard flexural strength, the FAA specifies 700 PSI minimum. Uh, we have a maximum cement content of 400 pounds. That's going to be changed shortly. It's going to be reduced. Um, shrinkage, 0.03%, okay, and, and that's a modified C-157 test. When I say modified, what I mean is we never use moisture, okay? This is air cured from start to finish. Doesn't get submerged in a bath for 24 hours like the ASTM says and stay in a moist room. This is uh, strictly in air and the, the requirement is 0.03%. And people may ask, well, well, you know, why don't you follow the standard? Why not in water? Well, when you place this concrete pavement, do you submerge it in water to cure it? No, right? Um, we don't moist, moist cure it uh, for 28 days. So we're mimicking the field conditions. So we want to make sure that that shrinkage is at 0.03% or less. 70% um, minimum volume of ag aggregates. Uh, this is a big one, all right? And Tom talked about combining aggregates and getting a well-blended um, aggregate structure and reducing your paste, which reduces your shrinkage, okay? So this sounds like a lot of aggregate. Um, but I'm gonna show you how it, how it works. Uh, test section prior to production. I mentioned this before. Um, you wanna work out all those kinks, okay? You've got a big, you got a paving crew, uh, you got a finishing crew, uh, you got a uh, curing that's involved and timing of cutting joints, uh, which is extremely important. Uh, if you wait till the next day to cut your joints, uh, you waited too long. You need to be able to make that first saw cut on those joints as soon as you could get, the pavement can withstand the weight of the saw and without tearing uh, the adjacent concrete. You want to make those cuts. We make an eighth of an inch cut, 
Uh, for this particular slab, it's 18 inches thick. Uh, our civil designers uh, say the depth of that cut should be a third of the thickness plus an inch. So six plus one is se seven inches. That's the depth of our initial cut. <coughs> and the last thing, we don't accept cracks. Now, um, this is a little controversial. Uh, a lot of contractors will say all oh, concrete cracks. Uh, it doesn't have to. And uh, for airfield pavements, especially on a runway, we don't accept it at all. And for the 2,800 slabs uh, that we produced on this job, only six had to be replaced. So 0.2%. So that's not much cracking, and it can be controlled if you pay attention to what you're doing. Here's the mixed design uh, that was used for this runway. Um, you have 330 cement, 220 uh, slag, so 40% slag uh, substitution. Here are your aggregates. We use a number three stone, a number 57 stone, and a number eight stone, uh, plus your sand. Okay, your, your number three stone is a two inch stone, 57, you got your one inch material, and number eight, your three eighth inch. Um, combined uh, aggregate volume is 71%. Remember I said 70%, we actually got 71%. Uh, percent for this mix. Um, target slump here with slip form paving, one and a half inches was our target, 5% air. 0 0.40 water cement ratio. So here's a look at what the gradation looks like. This is the gradation for the number three aggregate that was used. Here's our number 57 and our number eight. When you combine uh, all of those at the quantities that were used, you come up with uh, this gradation here. And for 10 inch pavements, here's what our spec calls for. All right, so as you can see on each of those sieves, we met what the spec required. Here's a, graphically what that looks like. The green is the actual mix design, uh, the blue and the the blue are the upper limits on the gradation, and the uh, magenta is the lower limits for the gradation. Okay, just got cut off a little. Shillstone chart. Okay, so Shillstone made this chart back in the late '80s, um, and it's it's very good if you uh, to look at and consider if you're doing slip form paving. Um, Basically, you need to know what your workability factor is and your coarseness factor. The very simple calculations, as long as you have your gradation, um, the calculation is right here on, on the slide. You just need to know what's retained on the three eighths, what's on the number eight, <coughs> and your cementitious content. You come up with your coarseness factor and your workability factor. Shillstone's chart for slip form paving, you want to be in this zone two, okay? Uh, ideally, this parallelogram uh, here in red is perfect for slip form paving. You want to, you want to be, if you're in there, you, you're, you're doing great. Um, if, if you're in uh, zone three, it still means you're well graded. Um, but you primarily have intermediate aggregates and, you know, um, very little uh, of the high course aggregate, like we have number three uh, aggregate in this mix. Um, if you're in zone four, you're sandy. And if you're in zone five, you're too rocky. Um, zone one, uh, you're gap graded and you don't want to be there either. Um, so if you take a look at the mix that we use for JFK, our coarseness factor is 71 and work, workability is 33. So we're just outside this uh, red ideal sweet spot, if you want to call it. Um, but again, this has been around since the late 80s. Use it. 
um, we find it works uh, pretty well for our pavements. <clears throat> Here's some data uh, taken from all our testing that was done. Um, we averaged just under 1300 PSI flex strength. That's the highest we've ever averaged, by the way. I was kind of uh, shocked at how high our numbers were. Um, air content was pretty much on target, just under 5%. We performed the microwave test, so we measure our water content uh, just below what was designed for at a 0.39. A slump was just under one on average, uh, so very low uh, slump. And here's a look at, you know, that 1282, you know, that's just not a couple data points. That's over 400 tests, uh, the average of 400 tests that we've run. So 1282 for an average. And look at that standard deviation. That's, that's, that's pretty low, which means you're pretty consistent uh, throughout the project. Uh, which was great. Um, so we had some very good concrete uh, for this project. Um, construction. Oh boy, I don't know what happened here. <laughs> Didn't look like this at home. So quality control and quality acceptance. So the contractor hired a, a lab to perform their own testing. Um, they pretty much uh, did all the testing we did, except for the microwave test for water content. So they made their own beams. We made ours. Uh, just for, you know, for we also ran a permeability test just to see where we are. Not that it's important in a pavement like this, but you know, we ran the permeability test as well. So here's a look at. Uh, your uh, paving operation. So you've got you, uh, two pavers, you know, one place in the concrete, you got your slip form paver, you have two load transfer vehicles, one for the front paver and this one for the one behind it. And at the tail end, I call the caboose here, uh, you got your final finish and your curing uh, operation from, from this uh, equipment. Obviously, you have a lot of people uh, monitoring the, these trucks. Um, here's a look at <coughs> the, uh, the paver that was shown in the diagram. This is the uh, load transfer vehicle for the slip form paver behind uh, this paver. You got the other load transfer conveyor belt that this truck is dumping into in front of this paver. Uh, what's important? Continuous concrete feed, right? So this is part of the reason we, we established the on-site batch plants. You have to have a continuous feed of, uh, of material. I mean, ideally you want those pavers, uh, no matter how slow they're crawling forward, but to keep them in, in constant motion uh, as much as possible. Um, obviously you can't, you can't do that throughout the project, but as much as possible, you want to keep those pavers moving at a, at a constant rate. So we need a constant feed of material. <coughs> so here's what a one inch slump looks like <laughs> of this mix. Um, so uh, very robust uh, concrete mix. Is what it looks like coming out the the, uh, the paver on the back end. You'll see some uh, some folks doing some finishing here, um, and you've got your uh, final finish and curing machine back here. You know, one of the things you want to look at in construction: make sure this caboose, as I call it, uh, doesn't stray too far back here. Okay, he should be relatively close to uh, the slip form paver, uh, 100, 200 feet behind uh, at most. Um, you wanna make sure that you're curing uh, as, as quickly as possible, especially on the hot days. Uh, you know, we, we poured over the summer months, uh, 
there's a lot of wind at JFK, which doesn't help with your evaporation rate. You want to get that curing compound down. <clears throat> Again, lots of lots of finishing crews here. Um, you know, Tom touched on you know at your edges. You don't want that sloughing. Uh, you want to make sure you've got the your coarse aggregate um, at, at your edges, so you don't get those uh, weak points at the edge. Um, here's your final finish and, and curing again. Um, also, here you go. You got your uh, survey is checking grades uh, at all times. Um, so we had eight paving lanes, uh, 25 feet uh, in width, 25 feet in length uh, to make up the 200 foot wide runway. Um, but yeah, overall, you know, I, I think a really good job and we got some really good uh, data, not too much cracking. Um, here's what we look like. Uh, this is an aerial from August. Uh, in September, uh, we finished in October. Um, here's the ribbon cutting in November. Um, so job well done.